welcome to Playing With Fire, the podcast for people who are ready to custom build their love. We're talking about non-monogamy, however you design it, as an individuation opportunity. Want to leave the default and make your life spectacularly you? You're in the right place. So here we are again. We are. And I am thrilled to talk about a topic that feels uplifting. And first, we're going to start off with a little dive into the darkness. Which is appropriate. It's appropriate. Because we're recording. The longest night of the year. Yep. Happy belated solstice to you all. Um, so by the time you hear this, in fact, the light will have begun to return. And when I tossed out the idea for this episode, it was because I, I've been thinking a lot about how people often show up into a call with me or show up in my coaching space or show up just honestly, even on a date with me. Frequently, people are showing up with some some big ouches, some big troubles, some some sense of a loss of hope, a loss of hopefulness that opening, that being in an open relationship, that being in, let's say, even just a complex relationship, that that could be okay for them. Now, I mean, that makes sense, okay. right? I'm yeah. a coach in the realm of helping people move out of monogamous paradigm practices and into something more, whatever that more looks like for them. So it makes sense that if you're looking for help, you might be in kind of a dark spot. Yeah, that makes sense. So I wanted to address this because first off, you don't have to wait till you're in a tough spot or a dark spot or a difficult spot or con like super confused and feeling hopeless to ask for help. Well, no matter what your relationship structure is, the number one thing I hear from all of my relational therapist friends is that people wait too long to ask for help. Well, I know that's true of me. Um, day to day, I have trouble asking for help, but that... Well, day to day you do, but actually, I, relationally, that's true too. Yes. Have you ever thought to reach out for help from a professional or even from a friend who might be able to really hold space for your relational struggles before it was urgent? Oh, no. Yeah. No, I usually... Sorry, that's kind of an uncomfortable question, no, but, but I know I, um, The fact is true. that more often than not, well, universally so far, it's, Thus the, far. it's the hard times, the the... The times when I'm, I'm, I'm not happy about how I'm showing up in the moment, in a moment, in that moment, I think about asking for help. And then do you? Really vanishingly rarely. Yeah. So I, enough to say, no, not really. Okay. You know how your dad told you when you were growing up, he's good uh -oh. for something? Even if it's to be held up as a bad example. Okay, so I thank you for letting me hold you up as a as a mm -hmm. as an I'm example. A, I'm a bad example about that. As an example, you're a great example. A great example of of a way to potentially not ever get the support and help you need. Yeah. And so many people cross my path who imagine that relationships are something they should just naturally know how to do. And I don't care whether you're doing monogamy, polyamory, open relationship. Um, I, I, I don't, a friendship. It is completely reasonable to not know what the hell you're doing. Even outside a relationship, just being a person in relation to yourself, plenty of ways that I trip over myself without anybody else around. Right. So it's completely reasonable and normal to not know what we're doing. And yet in relationships specifically, a lot of people feel like they can't or shouldn't ask for help. And I've been hearing quite a bit from cisgender women in heterosexual relationships in particular who really want to work with me and their, their partner is resistant. Mm -hmm. 
they're opening something up or they've been open for a while. Um, and the conversations have started to feel circular. They've started to feel like they're just in a loop and they, they can't seem to get out of that loop and they can't seem to enact a new pattern. And usually they're started to feel like some urgency because it's leading to an overall breakdown in not just the relationship, but also in this sort of new self that they wanted to have. Like the reason they set out on this opening journey was because they really were attracted to this idea of, of autonomy and agency in love. And, and so once these loops start happening, well, it can feel really sad. It can feel. I know it did for me. That's it. It felt hopeless. You you just spin. Oh, we're back at the same problem again. Oh, we're back at the same problem again. Oh, we're back at the same problem again. How are we ever going to get out of this? And you can lose hope. And I had certainly felt that in my, in my first marriage, which was monogamous. And I had felt that, that looping. And honestly, I thought it was completely normal and it is normal in so far as it is normative. (laughs) It is very, very common, but I thought that When I, when I shifted my paradigm, when I was shifting out of monogamous mindset into uh, a polyamorous one, even though I didn't have that word yet, I imagined, I really imagined that it was enough to have that mindset shift and that I could, that like, okay, I had the mindset shift. I sort of like upgraded my operating system as it were. Boom. Okay. So now I'll act differently. It was not enough. Uh And that's what got me to a hopeless place because I I had just left a place where I was often feeling like I was caught in circular arguments and I didn't, I wasn't feeling like the relationship structure worked for me, jumped into a new one. And I had hoped that the structure of polyamory itself would actually provide me with the, the fix, the solve, the, the answer. And what did you find? A hot mess. Yeah. <laughs> because one, I no relationship structure itself solves a problem. Right. It right. just creates a different set of issues. Yep. Or diff- as, as James Hillman said, it's not a question of this problem or that problem, but which problem do you choose to work on in which your you life? Choose to work on. Right. right. Yeah. Um, that's a that's a paraphrase. He actually says he's actually talking a little bit differently, but yeah, the 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 relationship structure change itself. In retrospect, I'm like that obviously wasn't going to solve anything, but I really imagined that it would, and I know why I imagined that it would, and I had a lot of hope. Like it it was undertaken with this, like yes, okay, I'm going to move toward this. And right. I, had, I was I was filled with. Well, there was all kinds of trepidation, but there was also this like pulsating, seething sense of like, this could be the answer. This could be how I find my way. I've never really fit in my relationships. Maybe this is how. But I missed a really important part. And I think you did too, but tell me if I'm wrong. I missed the part where I learned all the new skills oh. and the new processes, and I unpacked all of my beliefs that were holding up my like sense of what relationships are even. Uh, yeah. Didn't do any of that. No, I really. packaged all those things up, held them tightly to me, and then walked into the new relationship paradigm and then tried to like make them all well, those old ways of being and you're, fit in there. Your shift was different from mine because you had been in a basically a don't ask, don't tell open relationship. It wasn't the same. Mine was monogamous, but you were something I remember that I see playing out over and over again with clients is the the shift. The shift isn't a mindset shift. I mean, you can have a mindset breakthrough in an instant, and that's great. But the paradigm shift into um, more than monogamy requires you to 
completely shift how you operate in your relationships and the questions that you ask yourself and how you make your agreements and the underlying philosophy of your agreements. And it, it, it means that you need to contemplate these things and then thoughtfully make them happen as well as a paradigm shift requires you to acknowledge the fact that we live in a monogamous paradigm. We live inside of it, like our cultural societal structure. And so even as we were um, rewriting our, our sense of this is how we operate, the outer world, the outer world was not was, changing. Wasn't, yeah. And we did something that separated us even further from our community because we asked monogamy to hold oh, every sin yeah. we had ever felt in a relationship, every disaster, every problem. We just, it was as if monogamy was a burrow, <laughs> like a little donkey. Yeah. And we were like, oh, um, lack of agency. We'll throw that there. Lack of feeling wanted and desired, we'll throw that on there. Lack of feeling true agreements, we'll throw that on there. Mm -hmm. Oh, a sense of ownership and entitlement, we'll throw that on all these things that we thought were problematic in our previous relationships. Yeah. We we're like monogamy's monogamy. fault. And now that you know, we're stepping away from monogamy, so we'll step away from all that and monogamy. Because it's monogamy's it. fault. It wasn't it's us. Monogamy. No, totally. No. It had I, nothing to do with us actually being the things that were creating our own relationships. No, my uh, my sense of agency uh, will now, you know, uh, yeah, you know, it, it, that didn't work. <laughs> it didn't magically change anything because, of course, it didn't. I mean, again, it like it, it makes perfect sense around here, but here's how this played out real time. Ken and I were we were engaged in a polyamorous relationship, but we had no idea what we were doing. It was very clear to us that we were both unhappy with how monogamy per se was was feeling and so we would we were just we would rail against it yeah, we would I, rail against monogamy itself as if it was acting on us as if it was an yeah. autonomous being and that left me feeling very safe and powerful in my new stance as a right. polyamorous person. How freaking righteous was I? Yeah. Righteousness. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Ew. Right. Past me. Current me. Totally icked by that version of me. 2010 me. Not cool. Not and, cool, dude. And what you were just saying about uh, monogamy per se. And, and yeah my experience of monogamy my this guy's experience of monogamy it didn't sit right for me and it had all these qualities that i didn't like in my life and i wanted mm -hmm. to change them and so it was completely wrong to take all of my personal experiences and thoughts and feelings about monogamy and put them on the concept of monogamy as applied to everyone that makes no sense those were mine <laughs> my individual it's, things and so to do in with fact you were your experience of monogamy disowning your agency right that i i tried to You're say that giving a, it a away ago and it just came out garbled but yeah that's it yeah giving away so here's the thing we also forgot to really fully embrace that we were the ones creating our polyamory because we were going to do it in our own unique way. Like everyone does, right. you are, right? everybody is. And so it was up to us to create it in a way that was healthy for us. And that right. served the, not, not just the needs, but served the actual like purpose that we wanted our relationship to serve. Which it good to know what your purpose what what purpose yeah. you're shooting for if you don't know what your relationship able to do that purpose is that's a great question yeah to is. ponder what is this relationship for and to go back to the to the hope one of the ways you can lose hope is to lose your sense of purpose if you don't know what purpose your relationship serves it can feel pretty hopeless like what and and now it's not feeling good so the relationship I'm not sure what it's for, and it's not feeling good right now. Where do you find your hope about what's coming next? That's it. We are meaning-making creatures, humans. Probably the octopuses too. Octopi? Seems like Octopi. It. I think they're meaning-making creatures too. So because we make meaning out of things, you're totally right. When I'm in a period of time or even a moment that feels crappy, 
it is really easy to have lost a sense of why I do this if I don't have meaning. Because yeah. meaning itself can imbue a struggle. It can it can give me something to to feel like, well, this is this struggle is worth it. Right. It can change the way the struggle feels from yeah. suffering to um productive effort. Different feeling. Right. So I think when when I think now about how many people come into my world and and they cross my path and they're talking about the way that they're they're suffering currently in their relationship structure, whether they're in monogamy and trying to shift to something more and they don't even know how to bring it up. And so they feel stuck that way or whether they are open, but they've kind of just, ugh, they opened and they didn't know what to do. And so a lot of mistakes were made and they know that mistakes were made. A thing that they almost all have in common is they feel kind of isolated about it. They feel isolated, even if they know that it's normal. So a lot of them will join Facebook groups and they'll join um, chat groups and things where they can feel some sense of like, well, okay, this is, okay, this is stuff that happens. These are other people who are figuring out the, the, the way through this particular dark piney woods, right? But so frequently our own struggles feel completely unique. They feel different because from the inside, my struggle has all of this, this meaning and this tone and this, this specificity. And there's, and it has, so it has inherent subjectivity. It has this deeply felt lived, this is mine. And this has deep meaning when from the outside, a friend might look at your situation and say, it looks like you're going through a rough time. It looks like you need tools. It looks like you need support. It looks like um, maybe you've you've bitten off a lot, and you, you might need more time to chew it. <laughs> it's really hard hard to have objectivity in and, the face of hopelessness. And without that, without that objectivity, and from from that internal subjective perspective, does it can be very easy to miss a lot of things, like. Um, you were just describing some, you know, a friend and looking at you and saying, oh, it looks like you're going through a tough time. And sometimes it's, and, you know, you had a tough time about with this, you had a tough time with life this time last year, or, and I remember that, you know, a week ago, this thing happened, they can, they can provide you some context that it can be really easy to forget about. Uh, and I'm speaking for myself here. Now, I, I tend to walk around thinking that I'm in the moment and that the other moments that have happened are affecting me. And um, having a friend say, this happened to you too. Like, oh, and that's affecting how I feel now. And that's changing it. So perspective, outside perspective, asking for that. And feeling witnessed. Because what I'm yeah. hearing is not from, from that. I'm reminded that it's, it's one thing to ask for. So frequently I'm teaching. So I can teach in a didactic sense. And there is, there are tools and processes and information that I like to convey to people. Like here are, here are methods, proven methods that have worked for many people. And that's not all. That's not all anybody needs because right. being witnessed is so core to our sense of humanity. Mm -hmm. Being witnessed by someone allows us to feel seen and known and understood and even when we don't feel totally understood, being witnessed can sometimes allow us to just be patient with the fact that this is a process, that change is a process, that love is a process, that love is a verb, it's happening over time. And so if I'm caught in a, in a fit of meaninglessness and I've lost hope and I'm dug in, or I imagine that I can't share my personal business with anyone. And I feel very resistant to, to being seen as a person who's struggling with my relationship, then I'm cutting myself off from one of the best sources of human growth and, and, and that connection, Yeah, the being seen, being seen, being yeah. witnessed, being connected to others. Hopelessness has a lot to do with loneliness and you can feel lonely in a crowd. So you could be in a big Facebook group talking about a topic or having it talked about around you. 
Um, and this has happened to me in church too, where I feel like everybody's kind of around me, but I don't actually feel like I'm being seen. I think it's one of the reasons why I value small groups so much because I can create some intentionality of like, let's, let's really witness for each other. What, what needs to be seen in your struggle right yes. now? Yes. And well, uh, I have, I've seen you do that with, with, with the kids, with the people that you work with, with your friends, um, you offer that, um, to the people around you. And, um, I'm, I'm very slowly starting to learn that that is something that I can ask for. Hello, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing a set of things. It's hopelessness, um, and, uh, difficulty. And could you show, could, could I show you what it is for me right now? Just have you see me. Yeah. Which has nothing to do with fixing. Ooh. Yeah. And I'm also very slowly learning to do that and not fix and not just jump into the fix because sitting and saying, oh, I see that. I see that this is hard for you can be what you're looking for. Absolutely. I, I think a lot of times people imagine that, um, that the growth process as you're shifting from a mono paradigm to something more, something a little different, something custom designed will be about learning skills and then applying them. And that's it. But in fact, I find it's much more iterative. It's about learning things, contemplating them, folding them into your life through the practice, uh, assessing how that went, bringing that to a community, talking about it, sharing how it's yeah. gone, being witnessed in the ups and downs, the highs and lows of it, marking the celebrations, folding that all into your life and then and then do it again. Yeah. Over and over again. Um, for instance, I, I'm thinking about the the relationship agreement process. You and I made our first relationship agreements um, with another person. Our, like we didn't even know to, we didn't really know what we were doing, but we were trying. And it actually really helped me to have the three of us together talking through our agreements. Because there was something about simply having each dyad just talking through while witnessed by another. Yeah, that right. shifted how we were processing that whole that whole experience, how we were, and and how careful we were about making sure we were saying what we meant and willing to mean what we say. Yes, holding ourselves and accountable holding and ourselves accountable, mm -hmm. and asking for help, showing up and allowing yourself. Oh, I'm going to tear up. Um, showing up and allowing myself to receive that support and that witness and that help. Mm -hmm. Not the easiest thing in the world. Well, Part of me doesn't, you know, I, now I feel like it's, it's much easier. It's, it's really coming with some fluidity, but that's after. Whew, yeah. I mean, it, it, a long time of not trusting it. And, and you said it earlier and that I, it's true of me too that um there are times when yeah i just don't want to be seen in the the spot i'm in whether it's because i'm embarrassed or it's just feeling like too much for me there are a lot of reasons why i might not want to be seen but being seen is so critical to the human experience and without that i isolate myself i um you know i rob myself of external perspective and that witnessing that just simply you see me, someone sees me and, um, but then I resisted it anyway. Well, somebody said to me in a session recently, she said, I don't know, our, our, um, our relationship really seemed to start to break down. I, I felt like I felt uncomfortable and, and she was talking about how she felt uncomfortable. And she said, I, I felt like I started to, um, lose control of how I was seen as the, as their partner was getting to know them more. And I said, oh. yeah, because if someone really sees you, you no longer have control over what they see you. If you're really allowing them to be other, to be separate from you and witnessing your true authentic self, the, the, the good, the bad, and the in between yeah, all that, right. not only do you, expose yourself but in fact they are other 
and they they will have their own thoughts about that they'll have their own judgments even even and let's be careful there judgments discernments they will have they will be taking that in and making their own meaning out of it and so we can't actually control what people think of us so if we want to truly mm -hmm. be seen and known and that's scary and that's one of the things i think that blocks us from really allowing to show up and be loving like loving in that verb sense yeah. of i'm going to witness you and then you have to make yourself vulnerable and then and then mm -hmm. bear the the tension of that and then yeah in order to allow you to be your own autonomous self i have to be able to let you have the thoughts and feelings and um and and perspectives on me that you have right and so yeah and so i may have a reaction or a thought or a feeling about you or about how we're interacting and right. you can allow that to be separate and this is one of the ways we show up to help each other but it also happens in group atmospheres in small community yes where we can uh, show up yes. and be seen and recognize that our humanity is valuable, mm -hmm. even when someone thinks, wow, I don't know whether that's the best behavior or the best way for you to live your life. But you're still a valuable human. You're still a valuable human. Yeah. Your innate worth is present and accounted for. I So when we started this episode, we were talking about hope in that in those times when it feels like everything is just too much or it's too confusing. And I... I want to finish by saying that when I see people resisting, not, not nameless, faceless community, but when I see people resisting just being allowed to be seen and in community, I know that the process is going to be longer and rockier and often they're going to rely more and more on mm. one partner that is frequently what happens so the mm. the upshot of those those cisgender heterosexual women who are, are showing up in my space and saying i really want to work with you and it's not always it's not always this this particular scenario but that is frequently how it is i want to work with you my partner's feeling very resistant even though we've already agreed to open or we already are open and things are really rough Often what happens is we, we become insulated as a couple again. So the very thing we're trying to untangle, the, the intensity of monogamy and its, its insulation of us from everything that we need, often the thing that we need the most is to break those patterns of one person being responsible for educating the other and holding all oh, the space yeah. for the other. Mm -hmm. And the best way I know to do that is to get community, whether that is a local community that can hold space for you, whether that is a small group where you can really be seen in the, in the ups and downs and ins and outs of doing something against the mainstream, something different. But a group gives more, <laughs> more points of connection to, to ease that, that uh, tight connection that two people can get with each other. Yeah. Yeah. So if you are feeling that sense of hopelessness right now, I would invite you to, to consider us part of your community, part of the potential resources that you have. Ken and I run groups and that is one of the containers in which people can find community. And this is what we're trying to put out in the world is yeah. Right. So the year of that opening is one of the places where you can find that. Um, there's a, there are cohorts that start, you know, periodically throughout the year. So you can reach out um, about that to Ken at JolieHamilton.com. Mm -hmm. And if that's not your cup of tea, then I want you to think about where are your resources? Do you have a, even a small group of friends that could form a book club about non-monogamy? Do you have access to a local community. Do you have, um, and cause sometimes there are already local community groups right around you. So yay. Do you have access to an online group, um, that 
maybe you could form a subgroup out of, maybe you could form a little study group within a larger uh -huh. group. Yeah. Um, if the group that you need doesn't exist, it might be time to create it. Yeah. So there is hope. There's always hope when you can find more meaning and when you can be witnessed in your humanity. That is, there's so much meaning in that being witnessed. 